Hey everybody, so today we're going to take a quick tour of the museum's curio cabinets. First, let's go over what is a curio cabinet. Also sometimes known as a room of wonder, these were rooms in wealthy Europeans' houses back in the 16th century, where European upper-class people would keep random artifacts, cultural objects, uh, biological specimens, you know, like taxidermy animals, and all sorts of other random things that they collected and put them in this room in their house. And that room would kind of be a conversation piece for when they have guests over, they would take them in, kind of use them to show off the things they've collected and found over the years. And these curio cabinets, or wonder rooms, were the basis of natural history museums. Because eventually, uh, individual collections started getting too big to stay in the house. You know, they got bigger and bigger. And so they kind of got, bought a building to put all their things in, and that was kind of the basis of the first natural history museums. And they built from there. So we're gonna go over kind of our museum's little curio cabinets. We have a couple. We have the one right behind me, which is our big one. And then we have one out in the front of the museum that's more of like a display case. Alright, so this is our curio cabinets. It's a really cool spot in the museum because it's kind of like a highlight reel of everything we have in the collection. Each shelf is kind of broken down by biological family. You can see all the labels there. And I'm just going to kind of go through some of the cool specimens we have here and talk a little bit about them. First, I'm going to talk about these right here. They're not really in the curio cabinet, but they're part of this kind of front display. Right here we have a mounted spotted hyena head. So we do on occasion get taxidermy mounted heads donated to us from like the family of big game hunters who have like their family members hunting trophies around the house and no longer want them. Down here we have a very cool mounted Rhea. You may be thinking, isn't that an emu or maybe an ostrich? So Rhea's are relatives to the emu and the ostrich but they live in South America, also a very big, fast bird. So let's zoom in here. So here we have a bunch of different species of taxidermy birds, and they're all broken down by types. We have ducks and geese, water birds, raptors. So the birds here are gonna be traditional taxidermy, so they're kind of made to look like they're in natural poses. Where the rest of our collection is gonna be more, they're called rounds, they're basically smaller, so that way we can fit a whole bunch of them on into our drawers, and you'll get the chance to see those when we take a tour of our bird collection. Up here, we kinda have just a bunch of cool stuff that doesn't quite fit in other spots. Like this is an Indian crested porcupine donated to us by the Point Defiance Zoo. So we do have a partnership with the zoo and they will donate some of their animals once they pass away to be used for learning, uh, learning specimens. This is a really cool one. This is a puffer fish. So it's kind of dry and blown up and then I think paper mache on the inside so it kept its form. It was just really cool to kind of see a puffer fish blown up as a specimen. So under our birds, we have our kind of very small fish section. So the Slater Museum doesn't have too much stuff on fish because fish are a little harder to store. Uh, lots of them would have to be in jars and they're a little harder to come by and just not really what our collection is focused on. But we do have some cool little specimens here. These are whale vertebrae, very big bones. Here's some more stuff from marine mammals right here. So this is interesting. This right here, this is called baleen. Now some whales will have baleen instead of normal teeth. Um, how they use it is they'll take a big gulp of water and then they'll swish the water out. And that way the water will leave all the, their mouth, but all the small like plankton and krill will get stuck in these. And then they can lick the back and get that as their main food source. Uh, this is also a very odd bone. This is called a baculum. Now, a baculum is a bone that some mammals will have in their body, not all mammals. For instance, humans don't have it. And it's actually the bone that is in the penis 
and it allows the penis to be erect in some species, where other species rely purely on blood flow. These are more whale bones. These are actually the ear bones of whales. So we, we have a similar bone in our ears, but of course whales are much bigger, so they have a much bigger one. Right. These, this is our aquatic invertebrate shelf. There's some interesting things here. Now this is kind of one of the museum highlights right here, these octopus. So these octopus are stored in uh, ethanol, so the alcohol lets them last for a long time. And people are usually very surprised to find out that they've been in this jar since 1940. Okay, so that means they are able to last over 80 years just hanging out in these chemicals. We don't know what species of octopus are because they were actually jarred before um, the red octopus and the Pacific giant octopus were separated as species. So now let's move on over. Um, here are some nests and eggs. So we do have a small collection of nests and eggs in the museum. They're kind of tucked back. Some of our reptiles and amphibians. So we have frogs in a jar here. So frogs, amphibians and reptiles are usually stored in ethanol as well, just like our octopus. But in some examples, we will get like dried taxidermy versions like this alligator's head or this little alligator. This big skull right here is really cool. This is a leatherback sea turtle. So this is the largest living turtle species. Okay, they're very big. Some people say they're sometimes as big as a VW uh, beetle car which it's crazy that they're that big. Uh, here is a couple of small fossils. We do have a very small fossil collection as well. That is a leaf fossil. That is a mastodon tooth, so early relative of the elephant. Let's try to get this. So their teeth are very similar to what elephants' teeth look like today. Uh, elephants will actually grow six sets of teeth in their life and they kind of slowly chip away and they grow new ones. Now this is really cool too. This is a narwhal's tusk. So a lot of people would call it a horn, but it's actually one of their teeth that's modified. So it's more, it should be really called a tusk. And this is kind of a cool callback to the curio cabinet idea because traditionally a lot of European curio cabinets would have narwhal tusks and say they were unicorn horns but now we know they are, in fact, the tooth of a type of whale. Here we have a juvenile grizzly paw. All right, so you can take a look at that. I'm gonna put my hand up for size. So you can see it's pretty big. It's much bigger than my hand, but if this was a full grown grizzly bear, it'd be even bigger. It'd probably be, you know, an extra couple inches on both sides. Down here, we have a clouded leopard head, as well as a Sumatran tiger head. Sumatran tigers are the smallest of the nine subspecies of tiger. They are found on one island. They're critically endangered because a lot of their land and habitat are being taken up by palm oil farming. So I would recommend looking up palm oil and ways to avoid it because it's damaging to lots of habitats. And both of these specimens were also donated by the Point Defiance Zoo. So these were both animals that were at one point at our local zoo. Here we have a beagle skeleton, just to kind of help show how artificial, artificial selection works. Because, right, dogs are just wolves, but have been artificially selected for different traits. And then the last section here is a whole bunch of mammal skulls. So I'll focus in. So this is a walrus skull, so like kind of a younger walrus, or it might be a female walrus because uh, full-grown males, their tusks would be much, much longer. Okay. We have a couple of sea lions and seals over here. And down here we have some harbor seal, I mean, harbor porpoises and some dolphins. So the, whole, the main point of these shells is to talk about mammal teeth. And if you want to learn more about the purposes of mammal teeth, I would recommend checking out our Nat nature in the classroom lesson on mammal skulls. It will talk more about it, but yeah, th these this section is our pescivores, or animals who mostly eat fish. Then we scan down and we have our carnivores, so our 
dogs and our cats. So here's a Sumatran tiger skull and a lion skull. Here we have a few omnivores, so mostly our bears. Uh, so you could tell what they are because what their diet is mostly because carnivores or omnivores are likely going to have these big canine teeth to help tear and shred meat, as well as the sharper molars, uh, flatter and smaller incisors. Omnivores are going to have very similar teeth as well. Then when you get down to our herbivores here, uh, herbivores, so these in particular are rodents, they're going to have these long orange front incisors to help them chew on very tough material. So the reason why those teeth are orange is because they have a buildup of iron in the enamel and these teeth will keep growing their whole life so they have to constantly chew on stuff to file those teeth down. Then there are other type of herbivores are ungulates or hooved animals. And a lot of times they won't have any top incisors so they'll just have a flat palate here and then their teeth will go straight into these flat molars that help them grind up their food. And then we have just a couple more ungulates down here. We have some deers. This is a really strange but interesting looking skull. This is a Malayan taper, okay? So right here is where their nose would connect. Um, their nose is similar to an elephant where it's, where it's a smaller trunk and it's very flexible. That's called prehensile. So they can move it a lot so all the muscle would attach here. Actually, I'm going to point out one more thing, uh, just on our carnivore skull, see this right here? That is called a sagittal crest. So the bigger an animal's sagittal crest, the stronger its bite, because that's where a lot of the muscle for the jaws connect and give it its bite force. Well, thank you for joining me on our little tour of our curiosity cabinets. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join me on the rest of our virtual tours and the other sections of our museum that will be coming soon.